The following is a presentation of Seaside Community Baptist Church. So here we are doing the series on Joseph. And those who missed the first 10 parts, here is a brief nutshell. I tried to condense everything. So I need your utmost attention because I'll be flying through this sermon. Okay? So Joseph is the shadow of Jesus Christ. There's something called the types and shadows in the Bible that Hebrews, book of Hebrews talks about. When Hebrews, uh, the New Testament is like the substance, Old Testament is like the shadow of that substance. Everything in the scripture points to Jesus Christ, everything and every event. And Joseph is one of the closest characters other than Joshua who are very uh, similar in the types and shadows with the lifestyle of Jesus Christ. Jesus was a beloved son of the father. He was betrayed by his own brothers and he was crucified and he died and then the Gentiles, the people outside his own people received him. That's the message of Jesus Christ. What about Joseph? Similar story. The father loved him very, very much. He made him the coat of many colors. But his own brothers were jealous and envious of him and they betrayed him. And when they betrayed him, Joseph was sold as a slave among the Egyptians, among the Gentiles. And God exalted Joseph among the Egyptians. So here are some of the similar patterns that we saw thus far. Both Joseph and Jesus were mediators. Jesus still is a mediator, a mediator between the father and his brothers. Both were shepherds. Christ said, I'm the good shepherd. Both were beloved of the father. Both were called the sons of wisdom. Both were first born. Even though Joseph was born for Rachel, Jacob truly considered him to be the firstborn among the, uh, among the other sons that he had. And both were hated without a cause. So when you look at the graph of Joseph's life, this is what we covered thus far. Here is Joseph, the beloved son, sold as a slave to Egypt, began to prosper in Potiphar's house, and he was betrayed by Potiphar's wife, falsely accusing him. And then he ended up in prison, and there he won a little bit of favor from the prison warden. And then again, uh, a situation came where he had to interpret the dreams of a cupbearer and a baker. And over there, the cupbearer forgot about what Joseph has done as a favor for him. So Joseph's life is like an up and down cycle. There was a certain man who was working in Toronto CN Tower as an elevator man. You know, you press the button to go up and down. They asked him, how do you like your job? He said, it has many ups and downs. You know, that's so true in Joseph's life and looks like some, it's somewhat similar to our own Christian walk. You know, Jesus Christ himself, when he came the first time, he came as a nobody. He came as somebody who was despised by many. If you look at what he did during his lifetime, it's not something that people would consider him to be a great man who put up posters all over the world. And that's the reason why we're sitting here. Believe it or not, he never traveled more than 200 miles from his hometown. He never wrote a book, never set up an office. People were trying to make him king, but he shied away from them. Jesus came as a humble servant in Philippians chapter 2, verse 5 to 8. This is what it records. Let this, be in my, uh, let this mind be in you, which is also in Jesus Christ, who being in the form of God, did not consider it robbery to be equal with God, but made himself of no reputation, taking the form of a bond servant, coming in the likeness of man, and being found in the appearance of man, he humbled himself and became obedient to the point of death, even death on the cross. Jesus, like Joseph, went down to the pit, the lowest state one could be. He descended to the lowest place, and because of which God exalted him. He who wants to be the greatest needs to be the servant of all, the Bible says. <clears throat> and that's what Jesus has done. So in this lowly state, Joseph was in the prison. He interpreted the dreams of this cupbearer and the baker. The cupbearer was executed according to the dream in the uh, the, the baker was executed, but the cupbearer was elevated back to the position uh, of a cupbearer for, for Pharaoh. 
but the cupbearer forgot. But during the course of time, something happened. The Pharaoh of Egypt had bothering dreams, and nobody in his kingdom could interpret his dreams. And all of a sudden, the cupbearer remembered, wait a minute, <clears throat> there is a certain individual in the prison. His name is Joseph who interpreted my dreams, so he passes on a word to Pharaoh. So Pharaoh summoned Joseph, and Joseph came before Pharaoh. <clears throat> and the Pharaoh explained his dreams, and he asked Joseph, would you interpret these dreams? Joseph interprets it ac accurately. And the dream was very simple. There is going to be seven years of abundance in the land of Egypt, seven years of prosperity, seven years of plenty, followed by seven years of severe famine that would devour the previous se seven years of abundance. So Joseph shares this interpretation. Pharaoh is very impressed with Joseph. And in a moment's time, in a single day, Joseph goes on from a slave to be the second in the land of whole Egypt, only next to Pharaoh. In a moment's time, his life is completely altered in no time. From slave to the prince, second in command over all the land of Egypt. And this is what Pharaoh says, you shall be over my house, and all my people shall be ruled according to your word. Only in regard to the throne, I will be greater than you. And Pharaoh said to Joseph, see how set you power over all the land of Egypt. Then Pharaoh took a signet ring from his hand, which symbolizes authority when they had to seal documents. They used this signet ring, and they put it on Joseph's hand. He clothed him with the garments of fine linen. The word linen that is used is the exact same garments that are used when they were making garments for the high priest in the tabernacle. And they put a gold chain around his neck. The Pharaoh bestowed highest honors on Joseph. Then something else Pharaoh does. He had him ride in the second chariot, which he had, and they cried out before him, bow the knee. And he set him over all the land of Egypt. Bow the knee. The word here is called avrek. In Hebrew, there's a little bit of phlegm at the end of every word, I think. So, avrek, maybe I said it right. This word is so beautiful and so full of meaning that God conceals some beauty in some terminology. Bow the knee, the word avrek. Try that. Only if you brush your teeth. Avrek. Okay? The word avrek means various things. The first two letters, av, means father. The second two letters, bar, means son. The last two letters of this word means mercy. The first three letters of this word, they read from the right to the left. The first three letters means to soar. The last three letters means to bless. And the complete word means to kneel. Can you see the message that God has hidden? The father, the son, the mercy, to soar, to bless, and to kneel. Because of what Christ has been through, God elevated Jesus Christ to be the highest in all the universe. Everything was placed under him. That's the favor that he bestowed upon Jesus Christ. Pharaoh bestowing authority on Joseph, similar to God bestowing authority over Christ's life. You see, Christ came in humble submission. He became, you know, Hebrews 5 talks about how he cried out with loud cries and tears in order to submit himself to the will of the Father. And once he submitted himself, he became the source of eternal life for you and I. The first coming of Jesus Christ was that of a servant. But this Jesus, who became the servant and even to the point of death, God exalted him to the highest level. And the Bible records in Philippians, the same chapter. Therefore, God also has highly exalted him and given him the name that is above every name. That the name of Jesus, every knee should bow. Avrek. Of those in heaven, those on earth, those under the earth, and every tongue should confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. What a wonderful thing Christ has done, my friends. It's not ordinary, believe it or not. I get so excited because I've seen the past in Israel, but also know the future. Here I am standing on Mount Olives, and here the people and the scripture says, he's going to come back one day and set his foot right here on this mountain. I was standing here, and here is Christ going to come and stand one day. 
I was looking ahead in the future. I've been in the place where they said Christ ascended into the heavens. I was looking up into the sky there right here. What a privilege to know that my Savior really lived. Christ can be proven historically, scientifically, prophetically. He is real, my friends. And today I stand and bear witness. The same Jesus who was taken away is coming back for Avrak. Every knee shall bow. may not be today, but it will be soon. Praise the Lord, our God is coming. Our Savior is coming to steal us all away. What a privilege that is. Pharaoh does something else. He changes the name. It's an Eastern culture where it goes on with a, uh, a tradition where they change the name when people are elevated by the king. Pharaoh called Joseph Zafnath Panea, which means, according to Jewish tradition, nobody knows the meaning of what Zafnath Panea means, but he who explains what is hidden. He who explains what is hidden. Not only that, Bible says he gave him his wife Asnath, the daughter of Potiphar, the priest of On. Among the other gifts, there's one more gift that Joseph gets. And the bride, her name is Asnath, which means she who is of net. Interestingly enough, she was born of a pagan priest. She's born and named after a goddess in Egypt. You know, you wonder why Joseph did that? Let me explain a little bit here. The Jewish people and Gentiles, this is the biblical classification of the entire humanity. The Jews and the Gentiles. We who are not Jews are called the Gentiles, and the Jews are the people that are separated by God. And God forbids Jewish people from marrying the Gentiles according to the Old Testament. So why did Joseph marry a Gentile? In order to understand this, Joseph, a Jew marrying Asneth, a Gentile, there's only one way we can understand it. The only way we can understand is what Christ did for the present day church was the Gentile bride. Now, the Bible says in John chapter 4, I think, salvation is of the Jews. Christ was a Jewish man. He came for his own. And the Bible says in John chapter 1, his own did not receive him because of the Jewish people's rejection, which is God's divine orchestration. Salvation spilled on to the Gentiles, and we are grafted into Israel. We have become a part of the body of Christ. The picture of Joseph marrying Asnath, Asnath representing Gentiles, that is you and I, Asnath belonging to this priest of On, who was the head in, the, in a town called Heliopolis, which is the capital of Egypt, signifies the world system and the world government and how Christ became the redeeming husband or the Joseph becoming a redeeming husband for this Gentile bride. What Christ has done is something extraordinary. He could have just stuck with his people, but so that you and I can taste the real God and his kindness and goodness, he redeemed us from this world system. He redeemed us from this paganism. He redeemed us from everything that is sinful and made us his bride. What a privilege, what an opportunity. And we become a part of this glorious inheritance of what Christ is all about. Isn't that wonderful? Isn't that wonderful, my friends? What Christ has done is tremendous. I'm born in India, and after I knew that Jesus was Jewish, I wanted to become Jewish. <laughs> it's no way possible. It's no way possible, but yet what I received from this Jewish man is something beyond comprehension. What I received from Jesus Christ is eternal life. And that's what we, you and I, are privileged, privileged with. God is not done with his Jewish people yet. But now is the times of the Gentiles that we are living in. Now is the time to experience the Jewishness of Jesus Christ. Joseph became a part of Egypt. Joseph became one of the Gentiles. He began to look like an Egyptian too. You know, that's why the Christ that Western countries know is a blonde-haired, blue-eyed man. 
It's not the biblical landscape. If you look at the Jewish person, it doesn't look anything the same. We made him to be one of us. We made him to be Joseph. That's why the brothers cannot recognize the North American Jesus. At one time in India, the uh, anti-Christian Hindu leaders were saying, all Christians should go to America. They were protesting because they think Jesus is from America. That's what the world has done. That's what we portray Jesus to be. He's a Middle Eastern man, a pure Jewish man. You know, but sadly, people have the perception because the way he looks and some of the paintings you see of Jesus Christ in the Renaissance, I don't know how you call that, Renaissance, Renaissance age, you see Jesus wearing a nice hat with a puppy. It looks like uh, Shakespeare. I'm like, how is that happening? Right? So that's what Jesus has been twisted and molded in these paintings. He doesn't look anything like what he belongs. But praise God, he's still the Jew. And we are the Gentiles. That's a clear picture, my friends. But we have been grafted into Israel. We have become his bride. What a privilege. The Bible continues to say, Joseph was 30 years old. You know, that shocked me right there. Because I thought with all those events that happened in Joseph's life, he should be at least 50 years David Bergman's age. But he, <laughs> he was a pretty young man, pretty young man. By 30, he was exalted as next to Pharaoh. When he entered the service of Pharaoh as the king of Egypt, and Joseph went out from Pharaoh's presence and traveled throughout Egypt. During the seven years of abundance, the land produced plentifully. Joseph collected all the food that was produced during the seven years of abundance and stored in the cities. In each city, he put, uh, put the food um, grown in the fields surrounding it. Joseph stored up huge quantities of grain like the sand of the sea. It was, measured, uh, it was so much that he stopped keeping records because it was beyond measure. The seven years of abundance has come. And see the scripture use a strange word. There's a sand of the sea. These words were the very words that God promised Abraham. That's how many descendants you will have. Like the stars in the sky, like the sand of the sea. It's almost like a prophetic fulfillment as to what's happening in Joseph's life. Joseph stored up all this grain, and these are the pictures of uh, the excavations they found in Pithom and Ramesses in Egypt. These were the granaries that Joseph used. Again, historical symbol, uh, uh, context right here. He stored up all the grain. It was too much, and it was plenty that he stopped keeping records, Bible says. So meanwhile, before the famine comes, the Bible records something else. Before the years of famine came, two sons were born to Joseph by Asnath, the daughter of Potiphar, the priest of On. Joseph named the firstborn Manasseh and said, it is because God made me forget all my trouble and all my father's household. The second son he named Ephraim and said, because it is because God has made me fruitful in the land of suffering. He named his two sons, Manasseh, which means forget. It's not the same forget like when you go to the grocery store and forget eggs. That's not the same forget. This is willful forgetting. Deliberately choose to forget. Deliberately, Joseph, even though he's afflicted by his own brothers, he chose to forget. And then he had a son named Ephraim, means, which means fruitful. Because God made, me, made him fruitful in the land of his suffering. Why does he still call it the land of his suffering? Isn't he next to Pharaoh? He has everything at his bid and call. He's the greatest in the land of Egypt, but yet he calls it the land of affliction. If you see the pattern here, my friends, forget always comes before being fruitful. If you want to be fruitful in your life, you need to forgive your people that hurt you. You got to forget what has happened in the past and look ahead. And then only we can be fruitful in our lives. When Christ, the Bible says, when he wanted to give an offering to the Lord, if you have something against your brother, he says, put your offering right there. Go ask for forgiveness. Then come with the offering. If you want to see fruit in your life, if you want to see the blessings of God in your life, you need to move on from the past. Many people are stuck with their bitterness, this uh, anger, this frustration, and because of these uh, ruined relationships, and they don't make any attempt to forgive or forget. They say we love the Lord, but yet they have these huge roots that have grown so deep. But unless you uproot, tear down, destroy, overthrow the works of the enemy in your life, and go with the love of Christ, you will not, period, you will not be fruitful in your life. Forget comes before being fruitful. 
There's one question of ethics I want to talk about. Joseph was a Jew, and he had his sons. He's living in the land of Egypt. Well, he's in the circles of aristocracy, the highest dignitaries. How did he bring up his children? Did he bring them up as Egyptians? In their thoughts, in their deeds, in their actions? Or did he uh, bring them up as, a, as, a, as children who believe in this one monotheistic God, the God Jehovah, Yahweh? What was Joseph doing? Based on the future of Ephraim's and Manasseh's future, we can deduce and conclude the fact that Joseph made sure they knew the God of the Bible. How would he do that? You know, there are two ways Christians bring up their children. I've seen two extremes. One way is, well, there was, used to be a friend of mine in India. He used to come to prayer meetings all the time, and one day his mom said, son, you're becoming too spiritual. Go enjoy the world a little bit. She was scared that he's going to be a pastor or something. You know, we try to compromise in bringing up our children sometimes. Say, so, yeah, a little bit of uh, worldly experiences would not harm him. Little bit of entertainment, little bit of privileges and social opportunities. You'll have friends, you'll, you'll do well in the society. Parents who just compromise in their lifestyle. And I've seen another extreme. The parents who build their walls around the children like Fort Knox. Like, son, don't look at that. It's good to do that, my friends. But I tell you, you can't shelter your child externally. I've seen kids go to Christian schools, and once they come out of the Christian schools, I've seen them go crazy in this world like nobody's business. Getting drunk, taking drugs, doing everything that they missed for the first 12 years. What's wrong with that picture? Christians, are, parents are so scared about this world, they're so scared about even the believers in the church. Oh, the guy is laughing too much. He must not be a believer. You don't become like him, you mind you. Keep them sheltered, walk them carefully in this world so that nothing influences them, protect them from even knowing who the prime minister is. You can do all you want to shelter your child, but he's going to get out in this world one day. So how did Joseph bring up his children as children who know the living God? How did he do it? There's only one way that I know biblically, my friends. You teach God's values. The issues are the issues of the heart. Invest the values of the word of God. Invest the truth in the child's life. That when he goes out into this world, he'll know what sin is. And he'll have the strength. You protect him from all the evil that exists in the world. But yet, the fight and the battle that goes on in his life doesn't come from the outside in. It's from the inside out. You invest in the child. Feed him the word as David says in Psalm 119. I hide your word in my heart that I may not sin against thee. Feed him. Fill him up with the word of God. Teach him the values what God expects from the word of God. Be obedient to inputting the values of the scriptures. And if he doesn't listen, pray. Prayer is not the last resort. Usually when you see in the hospitals, the doctors come and say in a hopeless case, like, yeah, we've done everything. All you need to do is pray. No, that's not the biblical way of doing it. The biblical way of doing it is pray first, then action next. Input. Pray for your children like John Wesley's and Charles Wesley's mom used to do. Go with every child, pray for every child. Like Augustine's mom who prayed for 20 plus years until Augustine got, uh, got saved. And sinner Augustine became Saint Augustine. You don't know what the value of prayer is, my friend. Try it on your own child. You'll see lives transform. Put in the values. Give the fuel and also give the fire in the presence of God. Things will not be the same. Guarantee. If you don't believe me, take my shoe. Come and slap me one day. If it doesn't work, unless we pour out our hearts in God's presence, how desperate are we to see the breakthrough in our children's lives? Are we willing to pour out our lives as if it's a life and death scenario for eternity? Don't take things lightly. Your children are God's possession. Be good stewards. We need to invest in them. Pray for them. Separate them from this world, not by covering and sheltering them. That's one of the ways, not in a way that, you know, you like to see your child do things because he loves the Lord from the inside out. 
You can't tell your son, oh, son, you need to go to church this morning. And the son says, yeah, okay, I'll do it for you. He doesn't need to do it for you. Imagine he wakes up at 6 o'clock Sunday morning and says, Mom, I can't wait to go to church this morning. I want to worship the Lord. I want to hear the word of God. Imagine how your day would be. It's like, this is my same son. He's so excited to be dwelling or spending time in God's presence. Wouldn't you like to hear that? The change is from the inside out, and only God can do that. So how much are we depending on God to do his work in our kids' lives? That's a little rabbit, rabbit trail, but it's a very important one. Joseph brought up his child in Egypt. I grew up with 2% Christians in India, surrounded by Hindus, Muslims, idol worshippers, but nothing influenced me. When Christ changed my life, the Bible said, taste and see that the Lord is good. When you taste him, you won't compromise for anything else. It's so wonderful. You'll be always trying to be the light. You won't be afraid of the darkness anymore. I didn't care. I became a Christian. I was sharing the gospel with whoever, whoever I saw. They thought I was crazy and they left me. That's fine. But what I got is a pearl of a great price. I wouldn't compromise. But when you taste God, nothing can stop you. Have you tasted this Jesus Christ? Are you doing it for your parents because it's a tradition? Are you going to church because you have to do this? Are you doing it? Don't do church. Don't do religion. Ask God to transform your life so that there will be joy in your life. So that everything that you do for the Lord will be full of your heart. Full of rejoicing because you're serving a mighty God. Don't do favors for me. Don't do favors for seaside. Don't give because you have to. But if the Lord lays on your heart, do it. And that will be so cheerful and so wonderful, you will not compromise. My friends, what is yet to come is beyond comprehension. This, this life is like a little blip. Blip, you're gone. Bible says it's like a flower on the grass. And when the wind blows, this flower falls and it fades. And the Bible says its place remembers it no more. This place, it doesn't matter, but what is eternity? It's forever. It's not compared with time either. You might be gone today. People might miss you. And for the few days, oh, man, I wish he didn't go. But when you come back, it's kind of inconvenient for you to come back again. Because it's hard for you, us to fit you back in because your place remembers you no more. Life is too short. Somebody said, life is short, death is a guarantee. Everybody has to die. So what are we doing with this lifetime? Are we investing and living in the values that God called us for? Bible says in 4153, seven years of abundance in Egypt came to an end. Seven years of famine began, just as Joseph said. There was famine in all the lands, but in the whole land of Egypt, there was food. Where Christ reigns, there will be food. Praise the Lord. And then what happens? So when all the land of Egypt was famished, people cried out to Pharaoh for bread. Then Pharaoh said to all the Egyptians, go to Joseph. Whatever he says to you, do. Whatever he says to you, do. That statement should ring a bell for us. It sounds, whatever he says, do. It's a statement that is familiar that happens in the New Testament someplace. Any takers, any guesses? Mary. The Bible says the first miracle of Jesus in the land of Cana. Man, now I'm reading this. It's like it's coming alive. I was there in Cana. On the third day, there was a wedding in Cana of Galilee. And the mother of Jesus was there. Now both Jesus and his disciples were invited for a wedding. You know, when Jesus and disciples are invited, sometimes there are shortages. So that's what has happened. They ran out of wine, and the mother of Jesus said to him, they have no wine. Jesus said to her, woman, what does your cousin have to do with me? My hour has not come yet. The mother, his mother, said to his servants, whatever he says to you, do it. Same grammatical structure in Hebrew and Greek. Pharaoh said the same thing. Mary said the same thing. Let's look at the comparisons a little bit. The first situation was a shortage of bread. The second situation in the New Testament is a shortage of wine. The first situation was a famine. The second situation was a feast. The first one was a king's command. The second one was a mother's command. 
The first one was a public outcry. The second one was a private request. The first one was a Joseph's official act. Jesus' first miracle was recorded in John. This was the first miracle. The first one was public. The second one is hidden. I don't know where to go with this. You do your research on that. Why is this link? What is the connection? I'll leave it for you. Moving on. I'm coming to the conclusion here. The famine was over all the face of the earth. Joseph opened the storehouses and sold to the Egyptians. And the famine became so severe in the land of Egypt. So all the countries, all countries came to Joseph in Egypt to buy grain because the famine was severe in the land. Seven years of supply was depleting very fast. Just as Joseph anticipated, the resources were going out pretty fast. There was only one place they can get bread. There's only one source, and that's Jesus Christ, my friends. In this lifetime, Jesus said, I am the bread of life. If we are starving, and if we need sustenance to all the nations, there's only one place they can go. They can go to Jesus Christ because he alone can provide the life. He alone can provide sustenance. Believe it or not, Christians all over the world in different countries who are being persecuted nowadays with various trials, hardships, afflictions, still cling on to this bread of life. And that's why there's hope in millions of lives around the world. So we as believers need to know that salvation is of Jesus Christ and Jesus Christ alone. Bible says in Isaiah 52, 10, the Lord has made bare his holy arm before the eyes of all nations and all the ends of the earth shall witness the salvation of the Lord. If Jesus Christ is the only source of sustenance, why do we keep going to everything else to find our provision? Why do we put our trust in our, in our bank accounts, in our security, in our job security, in this and that, when Jesus said, I am the provider? Let's think about it in a physical realm for one second. Imagine your a person comes to you, he's all weak and weary, he says, you know, I'm feeling very weak, I, I couldn't sleep well, I can't even walk, can't even get up off my bed, I feel hungry all the time, and I'm so feeble and weak. So, okay, are you eating on time? It's like, what do you mean eating? I ate last Sunday. If he says that to you, it's like, what? Don't you eat every day? It's like, no, I had it once, it was good, and that's why... Uh, if that is your physical experience of finding sustenance, and it happens once in a while, unlike me, who has to have food all the time, nighttime have candy or popcorn next to me, even when I'm sleeping, not trying to wake up my wife, I put my popcorn in my mouth to soak it up a little bit before I actually crunch it. That's my strategy. So I have a strategy to have something going all the time. If that is me, and this is how we depend upon the food constantly in the physical realm, how come we believe and think that, yeah, once in a week Christ will do and he'll give me the sustenance for the rest of my lifetime? How is that possible when your spiritual being is de deprived and is famished to the core? You need to feed your inner man. You need to find the strength and we will understand the significance of being fed by this nourishment of this bread that is available with Jesus Christ only when we go to him. But if we don't depend on him, it really doesn't matter. It really doesn't matter. Christ is all we need because he's all that we have. He's Christ or nothing. Depend on him or you will die. He is the only sustenance, only provider, only strength to survive in this world. If you think we can survive in this world on our own abilities, on our own might, own capabilities, we will fail as a believer. We need to find sustenance in Jesus Christ and Jesus Christ alone. And he says and he gives an invitation, come to me all who are thirsty. If you're hungry and thirsty... Christ should be the only provider. Nothing else matters. Sever any tie that binds you to your spiritual ties in this world. Jesus Christ should be the only one. This communion with our Lord will give you the strength to face the struggles that you're going through in your day-to-day -day life. Back to the graph again. Joseph's life, betrayed by his brothers, sold as a slave in Egypt, Exalted in Potiphar's home for a little bit. Wife falsely accused him. He's back in the prison. He interprets the dreams for the cupbearer. 
Cupbearer forgets, he remained in the prison for another couple of years. Doesn't it look like a Christian walk of faith? This is how our walk is. It's always his ups and downs. This is a Christian walk. It has cycles of faith and hope. And all of a sudden you feel that you're in the wilderness. And all of a sudden you feel extremely spiritual. All of a sudden you feel depleted and deprived. Cycles of abundance and cycles of famine. That's a Christian life. Betrayed, accused, forgotten, you might be sitting here this morning. People betrayed you, they abused you, they ill-treated you, and today, this morning, you're sitting here thinking, I have no reason to be thankful to God for what he has done in my life. He just abandoned me for where I am. He abandoned my family, my health, my finances. He abandoned me, and I'm sitting in this prison for a long, long time. Where is God when I need him? If that's what's going through your mind, look at that graph. Look at the end for Joseph. He became the ruler of Egypt. God never forgets if you're walking with him. Bible promises he'll never leave you nor forsake you. Look at Abraham. Bible says he was good as dead when he begot Isaac. Imagine having that as a compliment. 100-year-old man, good as dead, and he had a child. And you look at Jacob, he ran away from home with just a staff and a cloak. And by the end of his life, he became a multimillionaire and made it to Fortune 500. How is that possible? The guys whose lives are hopeless. Look at Moses who was thrown in the river Nile in a basket, a basket case. Look at he turned out to be the prince of Egypt. How is that possible? Look at uh, Ruth, who was a Gentile, a Moabite woman who nobody wanted, and she became the, in the, she entered the lineage of the Messiah, Jesus Christ himself. Look at King David, an ordinary shepherd boy whose name still rings a bell in Israel today. Look at, uh, look at Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. Somebody called that in order to remember the three names in Daniel, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, my shack, your shack, and new bungalow. That's the way to remember those, it seems. My shack, your shack, and new bang- bungalow. Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. These three men refused to bow down in a Gentile country, in a foreign land, to the gods that they, present, that they were presented with. And they were willing to die for the God that they believed in. And they entered the fire. The fire did not touch them because the king saw the fourth man standing with them. And that is Jesus Christ, the pre-incarnate Christ himself was with them. God never forgets. And I was in this land of Israel, the land, the people who were scattered all over the face of the earth. But yet in 1948, they all came back together and the nation came into existence just as it was prophesied. The very existence of Israel is a proof that God is alive today. He's seated on the throne and he's still sovereign. God never forgets whether you're in prison or in prosperity, whether you're in famine or in abundance, whether you're in fame or in famine, in health or in sickness, whether you're lonely or otherwise, God is watching you. He's still with you till the ends of this age. He's not given up on you. He's the Alpha and the Omega, the beginning and the end. Bible doesn't say it's the beginning and he'll leave you somewhere here. No, he says it's the beginning and he'll make sure that you complete the race. He who has begun the good work in you will see it to completion, my friends. Period. Our God is a great God and the Bible promises in Jeremiah 29, 11, for I know the plans I have for you, declares the Lord. The plans to prosper you, not to harm you. Plans to give you hope and future. There's every reason for you sitting here this morning to be thankful to the God that we serve. That's what makes you a Christian and a Christ follower. Amen? Praise the Lord. So I think something did, something happened in Israel. I'm not the same anymore. Praise the Lord. Let's trust in this God, my friends, and look forward for what God is going to do in and through of us and through our lives. And let's impact the community, the world, for His glory. The Bible says, ask of me and I'll give you nations. There are many more that are perishing this world do not know this Joseph can provide the bread of life. May God give us a strength to live a life that is looking ahead all the time, forgetting what is behind us, and live a life that fulfills the calling that He placed in our